Fu, and thanks a lot for um, for having me. Um, so let me just pull up the slides. And can you just, if you don't mind, confirm that you see them so that we are all good to go? Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, Charles. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, I'm really um, uh, happy to um, um, launch that new um, uh, season of the um, uh, webinar series, uh, especially uh, on a topic that is discussing law and ethics in digital environment. And um, I'm hoping that um, as part of this talk, you will be able to grab and see why cyber cybersecurity kind of relates to uh, probably both aspects, um, um, because indeed lawyers do cybersecurity, uh, and, and cybersecurity uh, has in itself, let's say, um, some form of um, ethical aspect that we might be um, discussing today. Um, before um, starting and getting to the um, to the um, uh, heads and and, and so the nitty-gritty of, of the talk. I, I think it's just very important to remind ourselves that, as you mentioned, Borku, so really uh, information and, and communication technologies and their really fast development are really fascinating and, and really are offering a wide range of new uh, potential application. And, and certainly in the area like the one um, uh, that you described, so in, in, in digital environment, those um, um, development on the uh, ICT side are, can really be seen as enablers of offering new possibilities. So before we, um, we jump uh, into um, um, really um, uh, all about cybersecurity, I just want to uh, 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 play a, a short video uh, that hopefully will uh, play nicely, but, but that is just um, uh, providing some background on those possibilities and why um, 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 cyber, let's say, is, is so critical in, in the society. So let's just give that a try. So hopefully you, you grasp some of that. And, and it's um, really about um, the um, uh, great work that um, uh, Rachel is doing as a meteorologist. But uh, you can really see that apparently for her to do her job properly, uh, uh, ICT and technology plays an integral part. And really, my purpose for today uh, is to uh, try to answer that question, which is, so is EU cybersecurity um, the um, missing piece to a sustainable uh, environment. And to do that, I think we need probably to go through um, a couple of elements to try to help getting an answer to that question. Um, what I'm suggesting is to go through some um, iteration and also to go through a set of, uh, of course, biased or truncated assumptions. Um, the iteration are, are the following. If we want to answer the questions properly, I think we should do probably four things, which is one, uh, help uh, everyone to understand what is uh, cybersecurity, what it exactly covers. Then um, second important aspect is what are the key uh, cyber challenges raised by a digital environment? So the, the application we just saw with that um, meteorologies, but more, bro more broadly. Uh, going then to um, uh, looking at the EU uh, cybersecurity frameworks, and of course, probably even more importantly, uh, trying to see if those existing sets of both prescriptive legal rules that are applicable and guidelines made, made available by uh, EU agencies 
are adequately uh, addressing those challenges. As I said, I will be using as well a set of very truncated assumptions. The, the first one is probably not so disputable um, and goes around the fact that cybersecurity should be seen as a foundation principle uh, allowing the trust of the technology because you can um, probably uh, quickly determine and, and, and agree that absent of uh, cybersecurity and um, uh, depending on the vulnerabilities that might affect uh, all of the technology, you might really uh, get to uh, an outcome that uh, really impede, let's say, trust. So if you really want to have uh, trust uh, with users and the community, you really need to have cybersecurity as a foundation principle. The second uh, uh, assumption, which of course, a couple of months following Brexit might be uh, a bit more uh, of a, a biased one, uh, is to say that for all purposes today, we will say that EU is the world, or at least that the uh, EU framework as it is, um, is the um, uh, gold plate, let's say, for um, uh, the, the um, uh, legislative framework. I should say that, of course, uh, that can probably be disputed, but um, the good thing to some extent is that on the UK side, um, you have left the uh, EU not so long ago. So most of the uh, uh, EU rules that we have now uh, are, are already uh, implemented uh, on the UK side. So uh, even if it's a biased assumption, there are some value attached to it. So let me uh, start with the first piece, which is um, uh, try, trying to see what is EU cybersecurity. As you probably know, uh, lawyers have that uh, uh, tendency to try to have everything fitting in little boxes and definitions. So, so we'll just uh, uh, give that a try very quickly to see what we are talking about. Um, I'm fortunate to have an eight-year-old son, so uh, I can already or, or still avoid a kind of uh, those um, discussion here. And probably the uh, bad things for my son, at least, is that he will have a father who is doing cybersecurity. So hopefully, uh, I, I will be able to tell him some something uh, that he might eventually uh, not know. But um, um, that's, I think, still a, a relevant element, which is um, we uh, are uh, surrounded by a digital native, uh, or uh, kids are probably uh, more versed than we will ever be in that environment. Um, and they uh, probably realize, uh, as we uh, do, that um, the, the um, uh, security aspect of it is, is key and important. But if we move to some uh, real definition, let's say, so to speak, uh, we can find a definition of cybersecurity back uh, in the uh, 2013 EU cybersecurity strategy. And what the um, contemplated definition is, it's basically saying that cybersecurity so refers to safeguards and action okay, that can be used to protect the cyber domain. Uh, interestingly, it's quoting both civilian and, mi and military fields, and it protects those uh, against threats that are associated with or may harm the interdependent networks and information infrastructure. Cybersecurity strives to preserve the availability and integrity of the network and the confidentiality of the information contained therein. So I think that's a very nice and broad definition that uh, very easily helps to understand what is the overall objective of cybersecurity. It's really about protecting all of those me measures, protect, protecting the um, uh, availability and confidentiality of um, uh, the uh, digital infrastructure. We have a more narrow definition provided by the uh, uh, EU uh, Cybersecurity Agency, NISA, which is really down to the core of it, so which is the protection of information, information system infrastructure, and the application that runs on top of um, uh, those against the threats that are associated with a global and connected environment. And that's uh, frankly a definition that is also relevant to consider because we can really see 
that we are living in a more and more connected world and associated to that or next to that, uh, that means also an increased um, uh, amount of uh, uh, potential vulnerability. Cybersecurity, it's an area that also comes with a national level definition. You can hardly read anything about the, uh, that might fit in the slide, but that's not really the most important piece. What is important to uh, realize based on that is that each and every member state has its own definition of cybersecurity, which frankly is not always helpful to try to uh, have an harmonized view as to what we are speaking about. And conscious of that, um, the GRC, so which is a, a research service for the Commission, uh, tried to came out uh, back in, in December 2019, which was it's called an EU um, um, level cybersecurity taxonomy. So really to try to define what we are speaking about. And uh, out of the 15 points uh, that uh, they identified as relevant in the taxonomy, legal risk slash issues is only one of them. I would say the good thing is that it's already one of them. So, so that's probably gives me a, a valid reason to speak to you today about, uh, about the topic. So that was um, really uh, setting the scene as to what is uh, cybersecurity from a legal point of view. Uh, then I think it's important to move on and, and try to see what are the key cyber challenges associated um, uh, to uh, the uh, um, uh, digital environment or more broadly in um, the supply chain. When we speak about um, a digital environment, as Boku mentioned, we have a number of different things uh, that are coming into play. It ranges from uh, the satellite that we saw uh, uh, that for a meteorological use, but very often it's down to a little sensors. And of course, you can directly see two things with that example. One is that you have a very broad supply chain that really spam across networks and the various sets of uh, hardware and application, and also that depending on the tools you are using, you will be only, you will be able, sorry, to uh, apply very different technique to protect those assets. Because you might be able to um, uh, introduce a protection against vulnerabilities on a satellite, but on a really little teeny sensors, it's very complicated to protect that sensors against vulnerability. And, that's really one of the, the, the first uh, challenge associated with the uh, world we are in now is that supply chain management and, and trying to uh, preserve and protect the uh, security of the supply chain is really complex simply because of the uh, because the, the chain itself, let's say, is complex. A second uh, challenge that is that needs to be addressed is the vulnerability uh, of those uh, little elements, as I just mentioned, so you can uh, uh, try to attack a satellite, but you can also try to hack a little sensors, and both things are doable and are happening in real life. And it's not only just about um, cyber criminals or criminal activities, it's also uh, linked to the nature of the piece of hardware you are using. If you have a sensor, it's very hard, for example, to patch or update a sensor. So you know that the lifespan of that sensor is certainly not infinite. And that will affect, at one point or another, the, reli the reliability of the information that you will get through that sensor. So, so that is also um, a, a kind of key challenge that you need to have, keep in mind. Um, because, as I said uh, in, the, um, in the introduction, if you don't meet those challenges properly, the outcome that you will get eventually out of the piece of research you will do using a technology will be impacted. A third very important challenge uh, that, um, that we need to flag is liabilities. 
because when something goes wrong and something goes wrong, you, you have different uh, 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 potential for failure, let's say, whether it's a uh, wrong result being displayed or uh, whether some of the um, uh, data that you are gathering are just compromised because the system is compromised or if uh, you are using a sensor and it's not uh, providing the right level of information, when something goes wrong, it always comes uh, along with liabilities. And that's really uh, uh, the third key component uh, that should be uh, addressed and kept in mind. So that was the kind of second iteration. So we saw what is cyber, second, what are the key challenges, then, uh, moving on to the next two pieces, which is um, what are the EU framework to uh, try to address those challenges and are those um, rules that we have properly addressing those challenges. Uh, what I will do uh, here is really focusing on uh, the digital environment piece. So, and really trying to see if the framework we have is fit for the purposes of a uh, digital environment type of application. So, so that's really that's really the uh, that's really the idea. That one is probably also uh, quite uh, uneasy to um, go through. But if you um, if you manage to look at some of the um, some of the uh, picture on the slide, it's uh, I think it's it's done pretty nicely. It's a document published by the European Commission, who, who is trying to help citizens to understand why and how uh, EU cybersecurity frameworks applies in their day-to-day -day life. Of course, our purpose today is a bit different than that, so I will not go through that in details, but I think it's a, it's a nice way of, of realizing, let's say, that there are various pieces of um, legislation that are dealing with the issue. If we take... Um, for one minute, let's say an institutional kind of um, uh, hat, and we look at what it is to um, regulate in uh, cybersecurity space on the EU side. We should remind ourselves that all of, all of what is related to national security still is in the responsibility of the member states, and that typically the EU is lacking an, exp an express legal competence to uh, or in relation to uh, cybersecurity. There are some um, uh, proposals to change that to see how best we will be, um, react to cyber attack at EU level and the likes, but that's generally the, the, the context. However, with that context, uh, everyone realized that there is a need to develop a coordinated approach. And what people have been really good at is trying to see within the toolbox that we have, uh, what kind of legal basis can be used to uh, issue either prescriptive rules or issue uh, guidelines or kind of soft law uh, that will have an impact uh, on, um, on those, or yeah, on, on kind of governing cybersecurity. On um, identify other legal basis, um, the most used so far has been around the internal market or around common um, foreign policy and common security and defense policy. And I will briefly um, touch on two instruments uh, that we have or that the, the, the EU uh, has been developing around those areas. So just to give you an example. So let's go to those um, prescriptive rules and Let's uh, focus first on the framework um, uh, around NIS, so the Network and Information System Directive. Um, what is NIS? So it's uh, kind of an old piece uh, of uh, legislation. Um, it was adopted back in July 2016 and entered into force uh, also in, in August 2016 with the uh, obligation and requirements to have those laws, uh, uh, the, oh, sorry, the directive implemented in member states laws uh, by uh, May 2018. Why is NIS so important and relevant? Because it's uh, the first 
piece of EU-wide legislation on cybersecurity, providing for uh, a minimum level of harmonization, so really setting the minimum standards that member states should implement locally, uh, uh, leaving to member states the right and, and, possibly, and the possibility sorry, to uh, have uh, stricter rules um, uh, in their uh, domestic uh, law. What it's all about, so it's um, provide a set of rules or measures to boost uh, the overall level of cybersecurity in the EU. And it's taking one fundamental assumption is that um, if you want to have cybersecurity right, you need to look at major actors in critical sectors. Uh, one thing that you should note, even if that will be less relevant for the UK, is that NIS is currently being revised uh, with uh, some uh, change in approach, uh, but I'll come to that in a second. Uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, I'll come to that in a second. So what NIS uh, is trying to do is basically uh, three things, or it, it had three components. One is making sure that um, um, EU member states realize what is EU cybersecurity and uh, build up capacity to understand and be able to help, uh, let's say, in, in the area. It also established some uh, uh, cross-border collaboration at EU level, primarily uh, between a member state representatives. But what is more relevant for us is that it uh, requires uh, a national supervision of what, of what is called under NIS, a set of critical sectors. And if you look at the list of critical sectors, you can see that you have energy, transport, water um, distribution, health and finance, and you don't see there anything related to environment. You have um, Next to those critical sectors, you have another category uh, aiming at what is called digital service providers. But there as well, uh, you will hardly, let's say, find anything which is very relevant for, um, for the purposes. What are the measures that NIS is contemplating? It's really a set of requirements around governance protection and defense and, and uh, resilience against a cyber attack. So all of those things that would be probably very relevant in our context, but that, as I mentioned, wouldn't really apply uh, simply because the sector uh, that are under the scope of NIS are unrelated to uh, our area. So what are we left with? So if we don't have a set of prescriptive rules and requirements um, that uh, apply or that may be called upon, um, you need to go and find something else. And something else, uh, according to G20, uh, will be a set of guidelines or eventually some certification and standards. The good news is that on the, um, on the EU front, we have progressed quite extensively, let's say, in uh, developing a common framework of certification regime. Uh, and that has been really uh, the basis for what is called the Cybersecurity Act. And I'll just uh, briefly explain and describe what the act is all about. So the Cybersecurity Act is a regulation, so uh, a piece of primary EU law that is applicable by itself, let's say, across all of the EU member states that was adopted back in March 2019. It's doing two things. One is giving more power to the uh, uh, European uh, um, Agency for Cybersecurity, so ENISA. And secondly, it's creating for the first time an EU-wide cybersecurity framework for ICT services, product, and processes. So it, it really, the, um, the idea is to um, build and develop using existing standard uh, and schemes, so like ISO and a couple of others, um, and trying to, to build up certification schemes that will be applicable throughout uh, the uh, European Union. 
Most of them are uh, voluntary. So it's schemes that will be proposed by the EU when manufacturer or, or user of ICT product services or processes will be able to apply, let's say, unless um, those are made mandatory by uh, EU or national law. One of the one of the benefit, as I said, is that it's EU wide scheme, so they will be valid across all of the uh, European Union, and they are based on existing standard or technical specification. Is that good for us or for the purpose of today? It's almost good because if you look at um, what the um, uh, agency has, is currently been working on, we have schemes developed for SOGIS, so that's a kind of procurement law for uh, public authorities, so it's not really helpful for us. We have a scheme that is being developed for cloud uh, providers, which of course is an important piece of the infrastructure, but not really targeted specifically to the environment. And we just have uh, since uh, earlier, on, earlier on this year, sorry, a call for a, a scheme uh, targeting 5G network and application. We will have soon uh, a rolling program uh, for, adopted by the EU that will list those uh, topics and elements um, that the uh, EU are identifying as the next uh, important topics for uh, the for upcoming certification. There is no sign that anything related to climate change or, or environment will uh, find its way there. So we need to um, keep going. And um, a, a last set of prescriptive rules that we have uh, is much more on the kind of defense side. And it's what is called the EU Council decision and regulation on restrictive measures against cyber attackers. So what I'll try to see here is if at least, if we don't have prescriptive rules allowing us to impose a high threshold uh, for uh, the application that, that we are contemplating uh, for all purposes, at least will we be able to punish uh, those that will uh, target attack on uh, things like digital environment application. That's really the idea. Um, so what is uh, RMAC, so the, the acronym? Uh, so it's also uh, a, a tool, so part of the toolbox, uh, the toolbox sorry, adop uh, adopted back in May 2019. And it's uh, aiming at uh, uh, imposing targeted restrictive measures uh, to those that uh, uh, are really uh, constituting external threats to the EU or the member states. And it's uh, our, within the scope, let's say cyber attack against member states, uh, against the wide EU, or even against uh, third, sta third states or international organization that are relevant or partner of the EU. We can sanction under those regime those who are responsible for cyber attack or attempted cyber attack, those that provide a financial or technical uh, or material supports to the attack, or anyone that is involved in another way. The kind of measures that you will have um, against those people are um, kind of very uh, export control or, or trade sanction type uh, uh, measures. So it's around asset freeze or uh, banning people to travel, which in COVID time probably doesn't mean anything because we cannot travel anyway. But most importantly, um, it's unlikely, and at least we haven't yet seen any uh, application of those measures in the context uh, that we are uh, uh, discussing today. So you see um, some measures and sanctions for hackers against hospital. You don't see yet sanctions uh, being uh, uh, decided for uh, people attacking satellites or uh, sensors. So, so that's uh, still something that is not 100% sorry fit for purposes. Next to those uh, uh, hard law, we then need to see whether we have at least soft law or recommendation or guidelines 
that might be useful. And there, uh, as I said, since uh, the, uh, um, the adoption of NIS, the key agency to look at on the EU front is ENISA. They have done a, a, a great job in publishing a number of uh, recommendations and guidelines um, in the IoT context, but nothing that is really specific to a uh, digital environment. And around the different guidelines, and I, of course, I will not discuss uh, all of them in, in any great details, but what is important to, and, and I really encourage and recommend the reading of some of those, um, some of those publications, uh, it's really set the scene as to what people should be doing to try to uh, protect their, their infrastructure against uh, some of the vulnerabilities we discussed earlier. So either against um, a lack of security by design to some extent, so simply because you, you don't patch your, um, your uh, hardware or uh, you are just using hard hardware that by design are not secure enough, or against uh, really uh, criminal activities and, and hacking and the like. Um, but for all purposes, it's not, let's say, uh, fully uh, satisfactory. So if we get back to the question I raised initially, so which is, is uh, EU cybersecurity the missing piece of uh, a sustainable digital environment? I hope that by now um, you have some of the elements uh, to provide some answers to that. Uh, I reserve my answer, uh, but I'm happy to share my views. Um, but I, I really, um, I encourage you know, everyone to, uh, to step in and uh, ask any question you have or provide your own answer to that question. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Charles. It was a very interesting and insightful, insightful talk. Um, I would like to open a Q&A session for this and perhaps uh, I could start with, if I may, my, my question. Uh, when you mentioned that, um, you know, the EU's role uh, in this area or, and kind of the EU is ruling the world in the cyberspace and uh, it's not addressing environment on its own as one of the key policies. I was wondering whether you would like to elaborate uh, on these issues further. Yeah, so, so, um, so, so oops, maybe we should have the, yeah. Do you have an echo? No, okay, sorry. Um, so, so on, um, on, on that front, so, so um, really, uh, I, I think what, what is important to, um, to realize and keep in mind is that the EU has for a long time um, decided, let's say, to be a front runner in uh, imposing prescriptive rules in the cyber context. That's the approach the EU has been taking. Um, and it had started, let's say, a bit narrowly. So as I um, quickly mentioned, so it used um, a, a number of critical sectors that are probably those that are the at least uh, on the, the, in the eyes of the regulators, those, those that are the most at risk uh, if subject to an attack, okay? Or, or the, those that where the consequence, let's say, are, are directly the most adverse to a, a wider population. Um, that's the approach. And really, uh, I think what we are seeing now is a further development of that framework to go for a wider scope of application and even more, let's say, or more importantly, um, actual sanctions uh, or higher uh, penalties for non-compliance. And that I think it, it's something that is very relevant. It's not yet uh, down to uh, or let's say scope of application that we discussed today. But I think 
gently, it, it's really widening. And, and uh, I hope, let's say that at one point, someone will knock on uh, the uh, EU door and say, okay, this is a sector that is as critical as energy, water supplies, and a couple of others. And we need to have on board high threshold requirement and prescriptive rules to make sure that everyone that is dealing with those issues is dealing with them uh, diligently. I think. Yeah, thanks very much, Charles. Um, the next question concerns kind of ethical considerations. What of the role of ethical considerations with respect to environmental applications? Citizens and impacts of climate change, for example, and how might cybersecurity measure address this? Um, that's an interesting question. Of course, it's it's supposed that we um, have a common understanding of what those ethical issues could be, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I have the answers to to, to that. But uh, at least, uh, let's say, uh, uh, one side of the answer is that. If you consider and you accept my assumption around the fact that cybersecurity is really an essential building block for trust in uh, the in the digital environment, but let's say in the digital world more broadly, I think that if you you accept that assumption, you of course. You, you really take that as a, as a building block and foundation principle. And even if it's low, it's almost kind of, uh, of, of really linked to, to, to ethics because you need them to build up a system that will be able to uh, cope and address the, the, the applications that are being developed. So, and have a, a sustainable and a robust system uh, is probably a very key and, and important foundation piece, I would say. So, 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 yeah. so it's an imperfect answer, but, but I think that's, that would be my, my um, uh, initial comments on that. Thanks very much. Um, and it was noted that it was an interesting point that sensors are both vulnerable and that the law is undeveloped in this area, for example, protection of data. And this, this must be an area being rapidly addressed now with the growth of um, IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, would you like to uh, give some perspectives on that? Yeah, so, so you would really be surprised to see um, how easy it is to hack sensors. So, so um, um, and of course, I'm not a hacker. I'm just uh, I'm just a lawyer. But uh, but we um, uh, attending some of the um, uh, Enisa conferences and, and and events as legal expert means that you have the benefit and privilege of meeting those uh, white hackers and, and and ethical hackers and the like. And you you will be fascinating to to see how easy it is to hack sensors. And as I said initially, those sensors are critical for the application you are contemplating, but they are probably the most vulnerable piece simply because of their nature. So um, a sensor is just a sensor. And of course, it's one of its primary goal is not to be the size of a football pitch. So, so you, you really need to have a small little piece of hardware, meaning that it's very complicated to uh, protect that adequately against uh, both uh, attacks, but also against uh, just the vulnerability by the lapse of time, uh, because it, it's very complicated to patch those sensors. And, uh, it's not directly related to an um, environment, but uh, if you take some of the, the sensor application on the um, uh, digital data or health data uh, kind of things, it, it has been demonstrated that uh, hackers can easily hack, for example, uh, a, an insulin pump uh, and just make that pump functioning completely randomly, eventually killing a patient. You can 
imagine to have exactly the same around, I don't know, a sensor that is uh, looking at um, uh, some of the um, uh, evolution of temperatures, for example, if you manage to hack the sensors and, and, and uh, provide or feed data that are completely uh, uh, irrelevant, you, you, you just truncated all of the foundation since, since the very heart of it. So, so, so that's, um, I think it, it's something that people should realize uh, that the technology offers great opportunities, but in itself, let's say, is, is, is bringing uh, vulnerability. I think you are on the mute there, Boko. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it's very interesting your your uh, your view on that. And in the EU, maybe it's the, there might be more effective mechanisms because of the uh, the nature of the union. But uh, when we you know think about the international context, are there any effective mechanisms in dealing with this kind of uh, attacks or? Uh, do you think it's possible to, you know, implement this kind of mechanism? Yeah, I, and you can really see that um, gently and slowly here as well, you um, you start having what looks like a consensus about the fact that first it's an issue, which is good. <laughs> Everyone realizes now that it's an issue, and also second that there is a need for some form of harmonization of the actual response. What that will be actually looking like, uh, I think it will not be for tomorrow or after tomorrow that we will be able to have a wide range of internationally recognized prescriptive rules that will apply all across. But what I think uh, hopefully we should be able to develop in, in a relatively short slash medium term is a set of guiding principle that at least set the scenes, let's say an expectation on what it is to have um, a resilient and robust uh, um, um, digital network or, or environment. And, um, and, and that I think um, is something that we could hope or dream for and, and certainly if you take two big blocks of the world. So if you take uh, North America and the European Union, and of course, perfectly conscious that that is only, it's two big blocks, but it's only a, a, piece, of the, a piece of the world. But, uh, but um, if you take those two blocks, we are sharing already uh, a kind of similar um, foundation, because even if the approach on the US side is, far less prescriptive than the one we have on the EU side. There are also let's, the, the guiding principle that if you look at uh, NIST, for example, uh, um, they are really developing things that looks very similar to some of the EU, the, some of the EU approach. So I think we will be seeing hopefully a kind of uh, international or almost international agreements on what those key foundation principles should be then how those will be enforced and, and, and whether or not um, it's possible by just issuing principle to have uh, things changed. Yeah, that's of course really to be seen. Yeah. Thanks very much. And we next... have, um, sorry, Berkus, one um, participant has raised their hand. Um, so I'll just um, uh, unmute the Nicholas if you'd like to ask the, their question to Charles. Uh, Nicholas, thank here. you very much. Can you Great, hear me? thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. I just heard what you said about um, uh, regulations and 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 progress towards maybe more initiatives. But I'm French teaching energy policy in Scotland, and I was interested in um, maybe having your uh, opinion on potential steps that would either push towards more sectoral. Um, regulations from the EU on cybersecurity, like for energy, for critical infrastructures, uh, and I'm of, of course thinking about the health sector as well. Um, 
your soft law um, suggestions are also very interesting. So do you see any progress on, on specific sectors uh, coming from the EU because of the need to be precisely more and more uh, industry specific? Yeah, th thanks, Nicolas. And, and that, that's a, a very, um, very important and, and, and valid point that you make. Uh, really, I think on the EU side, it's fair to say that uh, the approach um, is exactly a step-by-step -step approach. We, we, we probably couldn't find a better word. And you can really see the evolution uh, and, and, and almost the kind of direction of travel. So if you take NIS directive at its inception, as I said, it covered only major actors in a relatively limited number of sectors. Those were the ones that were directly subject to um, the prescriptive rules and requirements. Of course, by contract uh, um, and by the very natures of the interdependencies, those requirements were pushed down the supply chain and you had a kind of uh, um, a good spreading effect uh, with if you have, I don't know, a nuclear plant that is supposed to uh, adopt very high threshold, that will, of course, apply to their suppliers, their providers, etc., etc. But really, that was kind of phase one of EU uh, frameworks, identifying major actors in a limited number of sectors. If you look at what the EU is currently working on, if you look at the prospect of NIS2, NIS2 makes at least in its current shape, let's say, is trying to do two things. It's broadening the sectors um, that it will be applicable to, with for, uh, some of the uh, public authorities, for example, being subject to the rules as well. And it's broadening the base with not only those major actors identified by member states being called by the rules, but applying that almost to everyone within that sector. So you can really see that you are already kind of one step further. And then, um, and I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's a positive sign, but you can probably see that as a way of doing to promote efficiency. Um, you have more and more really uh, almost instrument specific cyber requirements. Uh, and if you take um, another upcoming uh, regulation in the financial sector, so which is called DORA. Uh, um, it, it seeks to, uh, as well there, impose a strict resilience requirements in the entire financial sector. So, so really going even broader than the initial scope of NIS. So I think that's really the, the direction of travel on the EU side. Um, and, and whether or not that will prove to be effective remains to be seen. And uh, whether or not imposing sanctions for non-compliance is the way to go also remains to be seen. But at least that's the intention and, and that's how the EU is trying to raise the bar there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, perhaps maybe one or two questions we can take before we close the, um, the session. It would be interesting to ask how legal frameworks keep in step uh, with technological developments in the area of cybersecurity, as one of our attendees uh, comment on. Uh, for example, blockchain approach uh, offer promise for ensuring uh, data integrity uh, from sensors. How does the law and technology align in time? Yeah, so I think there, there it's fair to say that uh, law is always behind, but we try to catch up. So, so uh, uh, and um, and frankly, it, it's it's just a, a kind of very normal statement because it it can it's difficult for for that to be uh, to be different. So so. Um, you can probably only start regulating by the time you, you, you realize some of the good or the bad things that a technological development is, um, um, uh, is 
getting is getting to you. And in the cybersecurity space, it's even worse, frankly, to some extent, because uh, the bad guys are always ahead of the good guys. So, mm -hmm. so if you try to um, uh, cope and build um, a resilient network, you will always do that by reaction to attacks that you have already been receiving. And, and, uh, and it's no different than in many other contexts, but here is, is just, um, it's, just, it's just the way it goes. And that, um, the fact that those attacks are really getting more and more severe, more and more global, and, 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 and all of those um, uh, bad consequences that you're hearing, I just, at one point, triggering on the political side, the need to come up with new rules, new requirements to try to uh, improve and increase release, resilience, knowing that it's a kind of lost cause in any event, because as we know, uh, it's not really a question of uh, if you can protect absolutely against an attack, it's much more as, uh, how you will react by the time you will be attacked. So, so that's, um, that's the way it is. Yeah, thanks, Charles. And um, one of the questions relates to cost element. Cybersecurity can be expensive. I wonder whether you could um, uh, comment on the trade-off or measuring more or um, measuring better and protecting better the few measurements you have. Yeah, uh, and that's, um, frankly, that's, um, that's something that you, you really uh, have to fight, let's say, constantly um, at least in private practice, uh, to try to uh, indeed strike the balance between the cost of cybersecurity versus the benefit. And it's a bit of the same like in the, um, in the data world. Uh, you have startup who are really wi willing to develop great technologies and who are running to develop the better product like forgetting a bit about um, the fact that they need to be conscious about what data they gathered and how it, it, it's, it's going to work later on. And really cybersecurity is, is a bit the kind of same thing. So um, by the time uh, engineers have great ideas about new application, they don't really care so much about whether or not it will be hackable, not hackable, the kind of uh, a resilience tool that needs to be uh, built in into the uh, into the technology, and that's why let's say at least some of the EU initiatives uh, should be commended because by the time you impose to have kind of cyber security by design to some extent, so if you really need to show and demonstrate that you have taken steps for that little piece of software to be built. The, the most resilient way possible, at least you have achieved something. But it's true, it's a cost. And it's, um, I suspect that more and more it will be um, uh, a kind of cost of doing business. So, so if you don't take the cost, you will be out of, you will be out of business. Thanks very much Charles, for this very interesting and enjoyable talk. And before we close, would you like to answer your own question, question we raised? Is the cybersecurity, EU cybersecurity meeting is to sustainable digital environment. Yeah, thanks. So, 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 so I, I think that um, my answer to that, uh, and probably no surprise, is that I, I think it's, um, it's a key foundation block uh, and it really needs to address the challenge. And frankly, I would really be advocating for um, a digital environment application to uh, voice even more their, their concern, let's say there, to, to make sure that they are it's recognized as, as critical, let's say, as water, energy, health, or, or a couple of others. So um, that would be my, uh, my uh, uh, expectation and an and answer to that question. Thanks very much, Charles. And it was a great privilege and pleasure for us uh, to launch our series, Law and Ethics in Digital Environment, with your talk today. And thanks very much uh, for joining us today. And uh, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, for their um, contributions and questions and we hope to see everyone again for our next seminar on the 18th of March and we will welcome Professor Abi Brown from the University of Aberdeen who will speak to us on balancing the rights and regimes relevant to the digital environment. 
So I think uh, this is the end of uh, this session. Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Charles. That's a really great talk.